This week in the Lectures in History podcast, a lecture about America and World War I. Kevin Matthews of George Mason University teaches a class on Europe from 1914 to 1948. The United States had been a debtor nation. It had owed the rest of the world, especially the Europeans, money, lots of money. That's how the Americans had funded their industrial revolution. In 1917, that changed, and the United States became a creditor nation. The rest of the world owed it money. Professor Matthews also discusses America's entry into World War I and the role U.S. troops played in ending the war. Good afternoon. Uh, we had finished talking about uh, the Battle of Verdun last Wednesday. Uh, which for many people epitomizes the tragedy of the First World War. However, uh, Verdun uh, does not have the distinction, if you want to use that term, uh, as the bloodiest battle of the First World War. Instead, that distinction is at this place called the Somme, which occurred in the same year of 1916. There was no strategic objective uh, at the Somme. It's a little river valley in uh, northern France. The only reason that this site was selected for this major offensive is, as you can see down here at the bottom, it's where the French lines and the British lines came together. And the idea was that both armies could attack together, break through the German lines, into open country and have that cavalry charge that the generals were always talking about. Many of the soldiers who would be fighting at the Somme, at least in the British Army, were those volunteers uh, who had uh, enlisted uh, when the call to arms came in 1914, had seen Lord Kitchener appeal to them, and for that reason were known as Kitchener's Army. Not only uh, were these men induced to come, as you saw from those, uh, those posters uh, of women uh, wanting to uh, uh, induce men to join up, but the British came up with yet another idea to appeal for volunteers. This was just before they had decided to uh, introduce conscription or the, the military draft. The idea was that you could get young men from the same village or town, uh, from the same business or factory, uh, from the same university. They could join together, they could serve together. And this would create a, a, an esprit de corps, right? Um, uh, and these men would be with their, their friends, their mates, their chums, their pals. And for this reason, they became known as the PALS Battalions. And uh, there are all sorts of posters like this one that went up. Uh, I love this one, uh, trying to get the London cyclists to all join together, right? Ride into battle, hop off your bicycle, and give the beastly Hun some good British lead. Here's another. Uh, they really use sport uh, to try to get uh, young men to join, whether it's rugby, football, or or the old-fashioned kind. Um, these, these were also other ways to appeal for men to join up. What no one seemed to think about was what would happen when these units of men, all from the same village, town, university, went into battle together if the battle turned out to be a slaughter. The psalm very much was the invention, the creation, the brainchild of someone we've already talked about uh, the British commander, Sir Douglas Haig. Haig um, planned a week-long bombardment um, followed by the explosion of several mines that had been burrowed underneath the German trenches that would be blown up at the moment of the attack. And Haig assured his soldiers that the enemy fortifications, the enemy trenches, would be utterly destroyed and that they could simply walk across no man's land. That was the promise. This is what British civilians saw at their cinemas. Let me see if I can make this work here. Oh, this never wants to work right. 
There we go. The craters created by those explosions, by the way, still exist. German trenches weren't destroyed. Some of the dugouts that the Germans had uh, put in place were 20 to 30 feet deep, so the shells never reached them. When the shelling stopped, the German soldiers simply climbed out of their dugouts, set up their machine guns, and started firing. By the end of the first day, July the 1st, 1916, the British Army had suffered 58,000 casualties, 20,000 of whom were dead. It still ranks as the worst day in British military history. Many of those who were sent over the top were those PALS battalions. A soldier from the north of Ireland named Herbert Beatty, who was in these first attacks on the 1st of July, sent a letter home shortly after. And you don't have to write this down. I would just like to read this one small passage to you. This is what Herbert Beatty wrote. Dear Mother, tell them that there is not another Grosvenor Road fellow left but myself. We were tramping over the dead. There's only 400 left out of about 1,300. Mother, if God spares me to get home safe, I will have something awful to tell you. If hell is any worse, I would not like to go to it. When Herbert Beatty wrote those words, he was only 17 years old. And he was far from the only teenager in this battle. Despite this disaster at the Psalm on that first day, Haig um, ordered the attacks to continue. Just, just, just a second. Well into the autumn. And it was only the weather itself that finally forced Haig to call off the attacks in November of that year. By the time the Battle of the Somme ended, at the end of 1916, the British had suffered 420,000 casualties. The French, who also took part in this offensive, suffered 200,000. The Germans, it's estimated, suffered around 650,000. And for all that loss, the Allies gained about five miles of land. There was no breakout. Yes, sir? Did Bailey survive? Did Beatty survive? That's a good question. I have been trying to find out, and I don't know. And I'm not sure if he was in that photograph. Um, but I've been, I've been looking. I've been able to find out. Anybody have any other questions about the psalm? Yes, sir. Why did uh, Sir General Haig decide to continue the fighting despite the horrendous casualties on the first day? Uh, because he thought that if they just kept pushing, the Germans were on the verge of cracking and, and they could break through. Uh, the other problem was that he never went to the front. So he never saw what the conditions were like. Um, his his um, headquarters was always about 20, 25 miles behind the front. Battles like Verdun, battles like the Somme, are expensive, hugely expensive. And what the Allies and the Germans and the Austrians and all the rest who took part in the war soon discovered uh, was that these wars were mass consumption wars. They were total wars. 
And this meant that you had to create a new kind of politics to fight these wars. Uh, you, had to, you had to get rid of, at least temporarily, the free market, laissez-faire economies that most of these countries were used to. You had to go over to planned economies. To do that, the Western allies created coalition governments, or what were sometimes called governments of national unity. And by the latter years of the war, all of these countries had such governments. Now, these are all parliamentary systems. So in these governments of national unity, these governments, um, these coalition governments, most if not all of the major parties participated, here I'll take it for you, participated, here you go Kelly, participated uh, in these governments. And um, uh, and these three were among the most successful, probably Lloyd George, the man in the center of the most of all. Uh, he's still known in, in Britain as the man who won the war. It's the man who won the war. In Germany, by the end of 1916, by the end of 1916, uh, the Germans had, for all intents and purposes, a military dictatorship. A uh, dictatorship that was run by Hindenburg, but most especially his chief of staff, Erich Ludendorff. Uh, Wilhelm II was still emperor, he was still Kaiser, but he was, in effect, a figurehead. It must be said that the German dictatorship was never really able to create the kind of war economy that you found in France or certainly in Britain. Um, but they would be running the, the country um, for the rest of the war. Uh, the big problem, of course, for the Central Powers was the British naval blockade, which cut them off from the outside world. Germany depended on uh, uh, resources for uh, not just its industries, but also its farming. And this was true of the other Central Powers as well. And they couldn't get out uh, beyond the North Sea to trade with anybody. This led to uh, increased levels of, of hunger. And in the winter of 1916-17, the infamous turnip winter, when uh, in Germany especially, uh, in most places, about the only thing to eat were turnips, literally. There's no bread, no potatoes, little meat. And you might imagine what kind of a legacy this left, the memories that this left uh, among not just adults, but among the children who lived through this. It was during the First World War that a new term was created. Uh, a new term entered our lexicon, the home front. And that's because, for the first time, uh, the home front became a front of war. The home front was not only the place where civilians lived, worked, were the creators of the material that was needed for these wars, they were also directly attacked as well. Uh, the Germans, very early on in the war, began aerial bombing raids uh, of cities that they could reach in France, but especially in England. This is an amazing photograph of one of the uh, German airships, the Zeppelins, uh, during a bombing raid over London. You can make out Big Ben right there. Uh, when these uh, airships uh, were no longer uh, usable, the British developed tactics to get at them, the Germans switched to using planes to at least bomb London, including the famous Gotha bombers. And I don't know if these, these photographs can even begin to do justice to how big these planes were. But I must say that I can't imagine how cold it must have been to fly across the channel in that exposed position. You know? I wouldn't do that in August. Never mind November or February. But they did. Yeah? Weren't these like night raids too, so it would have been especially cold? Were they what? Weren't, didn't they do this like during the night too, so it would be especially cold if you're that Oh, guy? yeah, yeah. Yeah, because if they did them during the day, then they'd be subject to um, uh, fire planes being sent up against them as well. Now, these, these bombing raids were 
the, the damage they caused was minimal. Uh, but of course, the injuries were not. And, and the thing here is, we tend to associate the idea of bombing cities with World War II. This was going on during World War I. Uh, and, and of course, the Germans didn't even have to go up in the air to bomb French cities. They had those huge, long-range artillery pieces, the Paris guns, for example, that could bomb German cities. Yes, sir? Were these strategic bombings or terror bombings? Uh, I think we'd call them terror bombings. I mean, they, they had no tar specific target. Uh, they would just fly over an area and just spill out the bombs when they could. And they couldn't carry many anyway. So. When I opened this course, I was talking about the various Allied powers. I pointed out that the United States did not factor into any of the considerations of the European leaders during the July crisis of 1914. In fact, the United States would be a dominant player by 1918. And you really cannot talk about European history, uh, the first half of the 20th century, without talking about the United States and about talking about one man in particular, this man, the then US President, uh, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, Wilson, as you probably know, has come in for quite a bad press lately uh, because of his undeniable racism. Uh, that's a subject that's, that we have to leave to one side here. Um, I want to focus on his impact on Europe uh, and the world. Uh, but Wilson, um, Wilson, at the start of the war, was determined, like most Americans, that the United States should stay out of this conflict. He famously said at the beginning of the war that he hoped that all Americans would be neutral in deed as well as in thought. And he wanted it to stay that way. The problem was uh, that, quite frankly, there was simply too much money to be made in this war. The Allies, from the start, uh, began to buy, purchase huge amounts of material from the Americans. Now, the Americans in World War I were not the arsenal of democracy that they would be in World War II, okay? Uh, the Americans uh, uh, in World War I were much more important to the Allies as supplier of pr primary materials, goods. Uh, they were very important, crucially important, in the production and the supply of steel, and not least food. The Germans would have been very happy to have bought these goods from the Americans, but of course they couldn't because of the naval blockade. Um, and although this bothered Wilson, um, uh, he didn't do anything to stop it. The American economy was in a recession in 1914. The war changed all that. Um, to pay for these uh, massive amounts of goods, all of the allies turned to the money markets. Uh, the British uh, became the sole purchaser for all of the allies in the United States, uh, eventually to save money because they had the best credit, okay? Um, but even the British could only borrow so much. And by 1917, by 1917, there was a dramatic change in the financial history of the world. Up until this point, the United States had been a debtor nation. It had owed the rest of the world, especially the Europeans, money, lots of money. That's how the Americans had funded their industrial revolution. In 1917, that changed. And the United States became a creditor nation. The rest of the world owed it money. And that would continue. The United States would be a creditor nation until 1986, until the Reagan deficits made the United States a debtor nation again in 1986, which we've been ever since. Back at this time, by 1917, uh, even the British line of credit had run out and the Allies had to borrow huge sums of money from the American government after the United States got into the war. This would create something called the war debts crisis, uh, which I can see from some of the looks on your faces sounds very dry. It's not. 
but I'm going to get to that when we talk about the 20s and the 30s. Here it's enough to note that already, without firing a shot, the United States was already a crucial player in this war. Any qualms Wilson had about supporting the Allies uh, were uh, put to one side, uh, thanks to the revulsion that he and many Americans felt about Germany's answer to the Allied blockade um, of Europe, and that was the use of German submarines or U-boats to sink um, ships. This almost brought the United States into the war as early as May 1915, when an ocean liner called the Lusitania was sunk off the coast of, of Ireland. The Lusitania, uh, when it sunk, um, took down with it uh, t- over 1,200 civilians. And 128 of those civilians were American citizens. A hundred of those 1,200 were children. Now, you have to remember, this is at a time before governments started using euphemisms like collateral damage. And the Lusitania sinking outraged Americans. And it came very close to taking the Americans into the war. Yes, ma'am. Didn't the Germans take out an ad in the newspapers, I know in the New York Times, saying, don't take this ship? They they did. They did. But, But nobody took it seriously. Um, the, the, the ad was in there, and it was with the shipping schedule, so you couldn't say you didn't see it, but nobody, nobody quite took it seriously. Uh, f- oh, sorry, yeah. Did it, didn't the Lusitania, it turns out, like, have, like, wasn't it carrying, like, weapons and stuff? That is the claim, okay. um, and it's still disputed to this day. And, 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 and if we go through all of the claims and counterclaims, we will be here till 5 o'clock tonight. So I'm going to leave that to one side, but yeah, it, it's been claimed. Um, for a time, uh, the Germans pulled back, and they, they, um, uh, they, they renounced using U-boats to sink civilian ships. But the logic of total war uh, really meant that that couldn't last forever. In January 1917, uh, the Germans uh, announced that they were going to resume unrestricted submarine warfare. And this is a poster, a German poster, showing some of the sinkings just around the French and British coasts um, during this period, which is uh, quite a bit. Um, now, the, the, the German government knew, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, who were behind this, by the way, they knew this would bring the Americans into the war. But they had a, a, a logic to this, and the logic was this. By early 1917, Britain was the one country that was standing between Germany and final victory. The reasoning was, if we can starve, I mean literally starve, the British people, Britain will be forced to sue for peace. With Britain out of the war, we can defeat the French. The war's over, and we will win. The Americans will come into the war, But their army is so small, and it will take them so long to mobilize, that they will not have any presence on the battlefield. So from that perspective, this plan makes sense. To guarantee it, the German foreign minister, this man, Arthur Zimmerman, went a step further. He decided that the Germans could distract the Americans by inducing Mexico to join the war and for reasons I've never been able to fathom to have Japan switch sides. Now, Japan had taken all this German territory in Asia and the Pacific. Why they switch sides, who knows, but that's the reasoning in Berlin. Okay, a second. And, uh, and in the process, in the process, the Americans would be so distracted on their own southern border uh, that, um, that, that they would not be able to have any influence in Europe. To sweeten the deal, Zimmerman promised the Mexicans that they would gain these three states, Texas, 
New Mexico and Arizona, territories that had been taken from Mexico during the earlier Mexican War of 1846-48. What they didn't know, I'll go back to the other slide, is that the British were reading the German diplomatic codes. The British had broken uh, the diplomatic codes. Again, we know about Bletchley Park in World War II. Well, they were doing it in World War I, too. Sneaky Brits. Uh, and they, they gave the Zimmerman telegram to Wilson. Wilson handed it to the American press. And when the American press published the Zimmerman telegram, a storm let loose. These are just two cartoons from American newspapers at the time um, showing, um, showing this. I, I love the fact that in both of them, uh, to drive home the fact that we're talking about Mexico, the two Mexican characters have to be wearing sombreros. You know? uh, this one was more serious. And this drives home the point. Now, for the first time, this war was reaching into parts of America that until then had felt untouched by the war, had no reason for being worried or concerned about the war. And that was enough. On the 2nd of April, Woodrow Wilson went to the U.S. Congress and asked Congress for a declaration of war against Germany. Congress debated the, the motion for four days before finally agreeing. But on the 6th of April, the United States went to war. I'm sorry, I, I, I just wanted to get through that. Yeah. Why wasn't the Royal Navy able to combat U-boats? They did, but they weren't always successful. Um, the technology was, was not uh, as developed as we might like to think. Yes, ma'am. On the other slide there, what, was, what did it say on California for Japan, I believe? Yes. Say? The idea was that the, the Japanese switched sides, they'd get California. That's interesting. So... Never, it's like so they were, it's like they have Germany, have for myself, then no. they have Mexico for Mexico, but then the Japan for getting California. Interesting. Well, I would have thought the Germans wanted California too, but yeah, who knows? Uh, but yeah, that was the idea. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned earlier that in 1915 that the sinking of the Lusitania nearly brought the Americans in the war. What was it again that stopped the Americans from entering the war? The Germans backed off. They, they said, okay, we will not sink any more civilian ships on the high seas. So it's the end of unrestricted warfare that's kept the Americans at bay, right? In 1915. Okay, but you. when that was reannounced in 1917, that was the real reason that the Americans came into the war. This was the final straw. Okay, because, you. It, you know, again, up until then, that submarine warfare is affecting people on the East Coast. If you live in, in the far West, what's it got to do with you? Well, this made it something to do with you. Yes, sir. Oh, what is... Okay, so didn't Mexico, like, at this point just have, like, a major civil war? So what exactly was Germany expecting them, you know, to be able to accomplish? To distract the Americans. And, and relations between Mexico and the United States were very bad at the time. Right, but, like, Mexico at the time would have been, like, you know, kind of a mess because of the, the war and everything, right? So, yeah, but that wasn't, that wasn't in the calculations in Berlin. Okay. They, they, that, that they were concentrating on was distracting the Americans, and that's what mattered to them. When I talked about the home front, oh, yes, ma'am. Can you just go back a slide really quick? How far back? Just one. Just one. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. If we guys miss anything, we can go over this at our session, okay? Um, yeah, so the Americans are in the war by April. Now, that doesn't mean they're immediately sending forces overseas. It's going to be a while before the Americans can have any kind of effect on the war, Okay. Let me move on. When I was talking about the home front earlier, there was one vital element that I left out, and that element was women. Women in all of the warring countries were absolutely crucial to this war, to the war efforts of all the countries. Of course, women had been working in factories with the start of the Industrial Revolution, so there's nothing new about that. What changed was the kind of work women did. Because for the first time, women were doing jobs that had been exclusively, exclusively given over to only men. That was the big difference. 
the war work that women did occurred in France, in Italy, in Germany, in Britain, and eventually in the United States. The one thing that women were not allowed to do was to go to war itself. The idea of women taking up arms was simply an impossible idea for any, uh, any leader of, of either side to countenance. War was men's work. The fighting was men's work. Okay? There was one exception, and that was Russia. Uh, early in the war, uh, Tsar Nicholas II was petitioned by a few women to be allowed to join the army. And amazingly, he granted these petitions. After the first of the two revolutions in 1917, uh, 2,500 women signed up to, uh, to join what was called the uh, Women's Battalion of Death. I love that term. Women's Battalion of Death. And I love this photograph because uh, picture here is none other than that British suffragette leader, Emmeline Pankhurst. How she got to Russia in the middle of a war is beyond me, but she managed to do it. Okay? Uh, these women took part in the last offensive of the Russian army in the summer of 1917, and they captured over 2,000 German soldiers. When many of their male counterparts were running for home, uh, but they split apart um, after the Bolshevik Revolution. The British finally had to accept women into military service in, uh, in the summer of 1917 simply because they needed as many men as possible in the trenches. And so they created what was called uh, the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps to do uh, non-frontline jobs. Um, and... Um, uh, as well, so as well as nurses, uh, you've got this Women's uh, Army Auxiliary Corps. I have to say, uh, those are the ugliest uniforms I've ever seen, um, and they had to have been devised by a man. Only a man would come up with something like that. Um, but before the war was over, uh, women, British women, were serving in other branches. This is a motorcyclist with, with what was in the Royal Flying Army Corps, or, or I'm sorry, the Royal Flying Corps. Uh, women were nurses. Um, they were serving in the Royal Navy. Again, desk jobs. And, of course, in the factories, doing what, as I said, was traditionally men's work, or so it was thought. Americans tend to think that Rosie the Riveter, this symbol, uh, is only connected with World War II. In fact, Rosie the Riveter had a mother and older sisters in World War I, uh, like these women. When the United States entered the war, the United States immediately imposed conscription, the military draft. And that meant all young men were liable for military service, and that meant that these businesses, these factories, needed women workers, which they immediately employed. Women were also uh, recruited to serve in what was called the land army. Uh, these would be women who would work on the farms to take the place of the male farmers who had to go into military service. And, of course, there were thousands of, of American nurses. Yes, sir? Can you go back a slide for a sec? I can. Um, at the very bottom, it mentions something about tuition. Are they being trained to like, work in the field, or are they actually taking like school? I think this is for uh, women who attend the University of Virginia, and they're going to get free tuition. In exchange for? Yeah. Okay. Join the Land Army, ladies and gentlemen. You could get free tuition here. Women didn't attend the University of Virginia in those days. Well, they've got the University of Virginia there. Who knows? Women went to Mary Washington. UVA was male only until about 1970. Okay, I wasn't there, so I don't know. I, if somebody can find out why that is there, I would love to find out. Please, please let me know. Okay? Um, yeah, the nurses. Uh, the American commander of the uh, American forces in France, John J. Pershing, uh, one of the things that he immediately needed when he got to France were telephone operators. 
And one of the things that he immediately discovered was that men made lousy telephone operators. He wanted to recruit women. The U.S. Army said, no, you cannot. And Pershing simply ignored them. And he did it anyway. And he had the Signal Corps hire what became known as the Hello Girls. These were women serving in France, American women, uh, who had been telephone operators in the States. They were recruited by the Signal Service, brought over to, um, to um, um, France. Uh, Pershing absolutely prized these women because uh, they were efficient and they could quickly translate from French into English and English into French, uh, like this young woman. When the war was over, they were told they had not served in the U.S. military, even though they had been recruited by the Signal Corps. And they didn't get recognition until 1977. And of course, many of them were dead. The U.S. Navy was not nearly so skittish about recruiting women. The U.S. Navy recruited 13,000 what were called yeomanettes. Wrap your head around that title. Of course, they were not allowed to serve on ships. The American women who got closest to the front lines uh, were not recruited by the U.S. military. They were part of what you might call a private army, the Salvation Army, like these women. I can personally attest to their importance because my grandfather was an American soldier on the Western Front, and he said if there was one organization, one group that was always there for the soldiers, it was the Salvation Army. And I love this photograph, this woman. She's, I think they're baking pies for them, or maybe cakes. Um, now, these experiences were vital in the sense that many of these nations, at the end of the war, finally had to accept that women should be first-class citizens, in that they should be granted the right to vote. And in many nations, they were. Uh, the two holdouts of the major powers in World War I that did not grant women the right to vote were France and Italy. The others did. Uh, French and Italian women would have to wait until 1946 before they would get the right to vote. But don't get me wrong, these experiences of the Great War were quickly forgotten as soon as the emergency was over. And in many countries, the same lessons about the need for women, the vital roles that women play in war, had to be relearned between 1939 and 1945. I'm going through this real quick. Does anybody have any questions? No? OK. Yes, sir. Uh, why was France and Italy the two holdouts that um, didn't give women the right to vote? Uh, uh, they just wouldn't do it. Okay. Women were not going to be given the right to vote. Those Anglo people, they do that. You know, those Anglo-Saxons. Yes, ma'am. I wonder if it had anything to do with the Catholic Church. It could have, I suppose, but uh, the German, German states like Bavaria gave women the right to vote. Austria-Hungary gave women the right to vote. So I, I, it could be, but I'm, I'd be surprised about that. In total war... As, in all these, as all these countries were involved in, in total war, uh, emotions are stirred up, right? Uh, and this uh, became in, uh, apparent from the start uh, in the Great War. There was a lot of fear, a lot of anger, a lot of hysteria. Uh, and some of it was in reaction to the creation of these war economies, too. Uh, by the end of the war, um, there was a form of military discipline that was imposed in most of these countries. Uh, you did not have the right to quit a job necessarily. You did not have the right to strike in many of these countries. Uh, so you combine all that together, and it's understandable why there 
would be this kind of hysteria that, that developed. Uh, and I'm going to concentrate mainly on, on Britain and the United States for time's sake. But as you can see from this, um, from this uh, newspaper um, uh, front page, uh, in Britain, as early as 1915, uh, anyone with a German name who had a shop or store, a business, uh, who was known in the community, uh, had to worry about their home, their business being uh, attacked. Uh, and this occurred uh, also when particular incidents took place, such as the Zeppelin raids, uh, or the, the German, German bomber raids later on, or the sinking of the Lusitania. When the Lusitania was sunk, seven German immigrants were killed in London um, by mobs. So these, the, these waves of hysteria could be, could be quite bloody and, and quite awful. Uh, and as you see from this photograph, uh, when some of these incidents occurred, uh, yes, the police would show up, but they wouldn't do a whole lot. You know? One of the targets for this anti-German hysteria that you found in the Allied countries uh, that you might be surprised about revolved around the monarchies. This is a photograph of two European monarchs before the war. Pick the Kaiser. Yeah. He's the one on the left because he's got his, his own on the sword. Yeah, but what about the spiked helmet? Yeah. Is that the Russian Tsar? No. That is George V, the King of England, Britain, I should say. Uh, they're at a wedding. Uh, the crowned heads of Europe were intermarried, um, a lot of them. Uh, these, both of these men were grand, uh, grandsons of Queen Victoria. And what's more, they had this, this very strange habit of giving each other honorary titles in their military forces. And so they are at some wedding or something, and so the Kaiser's dressed in a British uniform, and George V is in a German uniform. Now, these photographs were not kept in the family closet. Uh, the newspapers were beginning to print uh, photographs before the war started. And so these kinds of photographs were not unknown. There are others with, with the Kaiser, with, with uh, Nicholas II, the, the Russian Tsar. The point here is, is that these crown heads, because they were intermarried, uh, were subject to uh, rumors that they might be trading secrets with each other. They might be talking. This is especially a problem for the British uh, royal family, and I guess this is a, an appropriate time to talk about this. Uh, before the First World War, the, um, the British royal family's name was the house of saxe goburg Gotha. Gotha. I always mispronounce that. It didn't help also that George V's wife uh, was known as Mary of Teck. Teck is a principality in Germany. Okay? During the war, there were rumors that there might be some communications between uh, the house of saxe goburg Gotha and their cousins in Germany. The writer H.G. Wells went so far as to say that George V's court was alien and uninspiring. And when George V heard this remark from H.G. Wells, didn't hear from him directly, of course, George V responded, I might be uninspiring, but I'll be damned if I'm an alien. Uh, in any event, uh, the House of saxe goburg Gotha, it's the last time I'm ever going to pronounce that word, name, uh, they decided they had to change the name. They couldn't go back to the House of Hanover, that's German. Uh, they didn't want the House of Stuart, that's Scottish. They didn't want uh, the House of Tudor, that's Welsh. Plantagenet, ah, that's French. And finally, uh, someone said to George V, well, you know, you really like Windsor Castle. And that is how they got the name, the House of Windsor, which they are to this day. When the Kaiser heard about this, uh, 
Wilhelm was not a man who was known for having a sense of humor. But when he heard about this name change, uh, he told a, an assistant that this meant that he looked forward to seeing that famous play by William Shakespeare, The House of Sax, or The Merry Wives of Sax Coburg Gotha, play in the House, Merry Wives of the House of Windsor. Um, anyway, uh, if this kind of hysteria could reach the highest echelons in society, it could reach anywhere. Uh, despite the name change, uh, the House of Windsor n never got, quite got rid of that German tinge to them. Um, later in the war, this man, David Lloyd George, was George V's prime minister. And uh, the prime minister every week goes to meet the monarch to discuss matters. And during one of these, uh, during his weekly audiences, before he would leave Downing Street, uh, Lloyd George, who did not like monarchy, uh, and who was Welsh, by the way, uh, jo uh, Lloyd George uh, would say to his assistants, well, I'm off to go see my little German friend. And he'd go off to see George V. I don't know if George V heard about that one either. Uh, he didn't like Lloyd George. Can't imagine why. In this country, when the United States got into the war, there was already a campaign for what was called 100% Americanism. Uh, and you have to remember, this country, the United States, had uh, witnessed tidal waves, not waves, tidal waves, of immigrants between the end of the American Civil War and 1914. And of course, many of these immigrants, not all, but many, came from Europe and their cousins or nephews uh, were now fighting this war, sometimes on opposite sides. And so the idea in this country was, uh, forget your past, forget where you came from, forget where your family came from, you are 100% American. And once the Americans got into the war, this 100% Americanism turned into an anti-German hysteria. Uh, which caused the Americans to do all sorts of silly things. Uh, the teaching of the German language was banned. Uh, you could not listen to music uh, made by Germans or composed by Germans. No Beethoven, no Wagner, things like that. Uh, German street names were changed. Some town names were changed. Families changed their names. Some families named Schmidt became Smith. I know a family uh, whose last name was Fuchs, F-U-C-H-S, Fuchs, very German. It became Fox, very English. Even Dachshunds got a name change. Dachshunds, I'll give you a second. Dachshunds became Liberty Dogs. And this here is just too much. Poor dogs. Uh, the same thing happened in, earlier in Britain, by the way. Poor dogs would be stoned in the streets because they're called dachshunds. Sauerkraut became liberty cabbage. I'm not making this stuff up. German measles became liberty measles. <laughs> this is true. The problem was that as this hysteria continued, it got uglier. It got uglier. Yes, sir. So my family, my grandparents tell me stories about how, because their last name is Hess, uh -huh. they tell me stories about how their parents would tell them stuff like, um, if anyone ever asks you about your last name, tell them it's Dutch. And then they, so we literally have like copies, like they did not print it out, but print it out written, and copies of like um, uh, family trees that are clearly like doctored yeah. to make it seem as if we're Dutch, yeah. when we're very much not Dutch. Yeah. And so my question is, in like, because they were up in like, states where there was a lot of German population. Uh -huh. How exactly did we manage to, I don't want to say persecute, but pressure these populations that are very, very German? Uh, well, in some places it was, it was easier to do than others. Uh, why that your family felt compelled to do that in a very heavily German area, I don't know. Right. But, but that family I mentioned earlier, Fuchs, King Fox, they, were, they lived in Cincinnati, Ohio, which has a huge German population, but too. they felt pressure to do it anyway. So... You know. uh, but anyway, as I say, this, 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 this anti-German hysteria got turned increasingly ugly, as you can see from these Liberty Bond um, posters, um, uh, which don't leave too much to the imagination. And eventually, they turned deadly.
This man, Robert Paul Prager, was a recent German immigrant. He was living in a town called Collinsville, Illinois. In April 1918, a mob uh, saw Prager in the street. They concluded that Prager, who some of them knew, uh, looked like a German spy. What a spy is supposed to look like, I don't know. But they concluded that Prager looked like a German spy. They chased him down, bound him with an American flag, and when he realized that he was going to be hanged, lynched, he begged for someone who could interpret for him, because he couldn't speak English very well, and when nobody would step forward, he began to pray in German, and he was lynched. He was hanged. There were between 300 and 500 people in this mob. The ringleaders were put on trial, but they were found not guilty. The jury concluded that they had committed patriotic murder. That's what happens when you let this kind of thing loose. Yeah. Were these kinds of events, like the patriarch murders and stuff, were there moments of like calmness in the inner war, or was this something that was like big throughout the end of the Second War? Uh, I think in, in many ways what happened was this anti-German hysteria turned into an anti Bolshevik communist hysteria briefly at the end of the war, and then a more general anti-immigrant uh, feeling in the United States. And so by 1924, there's a massive uh, crackdown on immigration to the United States, for the first time, really. Uh, but it, you can trace it back to a lot of this. So, In early 1917, Russia went through the first of two revolutions. Uh, what's often called the February Revolution, if you use the old uh, Julian calendar, or the March Revolution, if you use the Gregorian calendar. Uh, as I said before, I want to talk about the re revolutions in depth when we talk about Russia. So I think there is a more distinct uh, topic to talk about. What is worth saying here is that from this first revolution on, Russia uh, increasingly is fading, f fades away as a, a, as a factor in the war. Um, by the summer of 1917, the Russian army has devolved into a series of debating societies. Okay? Um, and what's important right now is that uh, with the disintegration of the Russian armies, the Germans could start to move their forces from the Eastern Front to the Western Front. And that set the stage for what was really the final roll of the dice by Hindenburg and Ludendorff. Uh, Ludendorff was really the brains behind this one, uh, and that's why they're known as the Ludendorff offensives. The idea was to take these soldiers from the Eastern Front, put them through uh, training to become crack soldiers, and then launch a series of offensives in, beginning in March of 1918 that would finish the war before the Americans could really uh, uh, come to be a major f uh, factor on the Western Front. And indeed, uh, these early offensives were quite successful. The Allies really did have their backs to the wall. These were hardened soldiers, hardened troops who had, had, had gone through the war. Um, so in many ways, it, it seemed as if the Germans finally were going to do in 1918 what they had failed to do in 1914. We tend to think that the war ended by the fighting on the Western Front. But the fighting on the Western Front was really one of four factors that ended the war. And I've mentioned this book before by uh, David Stevenson, the British historian of the war. Um, and in this book, uh, Stevenson argues that there were three other factors that were really as important, in, in some ways more important, 
than the actual fighting on the Western Front that brought about the end of the war. And I want to go through them just very quickly. The first factor that Stevenson mentions is that Germany's other partners began to pull out of the war. They finally had had enough. This began with Bulgaria. This is a strange map, isn't it? This began with Bulgaria uh, at the end of September 1918. With Bulgaria out of the war, the Ottoman Turks were isolated. And they're already under a lot of pressure with British forces and British Empire forces coming from Mesopotamia and up through Palestine, Syria, into Anatolia itself. So after Bulgaria pulled out of the war, then the Ottoman Turks pulled out of the war. Yes? Uh, when did you say Bulgaria pulled out of the war? In the September. Um, uh, no, September. I think it was September 29th. Um, I don't know why I remember that. 1918? Oh, 1918. 1918, sorry. Yeah, 1918 I'm talking about. Um, and then finally, Austria-Hungary was simply disintegrating. Its various national groups were pulling apart, declaring their own states. Uh, there was uh, disintegration in the army. And so this left Germany on its own. Related to this first factor was something that Woodrow Wilson did in January 1918, uh, when to the surprise of virtually everyone, he announced what were called the 14 points. I posted a copy of the 14 points for you on Blackboard. Uh, we're going to go into them in detail when we talk about the Paris peace negotiations. But, but the important point here is that uh, Wilson felt he had to uh, issue the 14 points mainly because of this guy Leon Trotsky when the Bolsheviks took over Russia at the end of 1917 Trotsky got control of the secret treaties that the Tsar's government had signed with the other allies the treaties dividing up the Middle East, the treaties promising Italy various parts of the Dalmatian coast and all that. And Trotsky published them to the whole world. He reasoned that if people could see that their governments had sent their sons off to die, not for some noble cause, but for tawdry little land grabs, that they would rebel like the Russians had. Wilson felt that it was imperative that the United States show that the United States was in this war for different purposes. And that's the genesis of the 14 points. The 14 points uh, were important because they seemed to give the central powers, the Ottoman Turks, uh, Bulgaria, Austria-Hungary, uh, Germany. It seemed it gave them a lifeline. It seemed that it gave them a way out. And that brings me to the third factor. And that was the disintegration of Germany itself. The German people had been able to carry on to continue the war uh, as long as they thought there was a hope of victory. But when it became known that there was no hope for winning this war, revolution broke out in Germany. It broke out first with the Navy. The German Navy decided that it was going to send the high seas fleet out to, 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 to the, onto the high seas for one last glorious battle with the Allied Navy, or navies, I should say, because this time the Americans were there too. The German sailors knew that this was a suicide mission. And so they simply rebelled. And this rebellion spread to the cities. Until this time, Hindenburg and Ludendorff 
have been able to, to hold the country together. But with this, they knew the game was up. And they were the ones who went to the civilian politicians and said, you've got to get us out of this. You've got to negotiate. That meant the Kaiser had to go. Wilson had made it plain that he would not negotiate with Germany as long as Wilhelm II was still the emperor. At first, Wilhelm uh, wanted to lead his army back into Germany uh, to uh, put down this revolution. But once he was convinced that that was no longer uh, uh, plausible, he did the one thing that I think you can commend him for. Instead of taking the country down into a, a, a horrible civil war, he agreed to abdicate. He fled to Holland. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's sad, but in some ways comical, that Wilhelm's end as emperor uh, would have these, this kind of, of a result because when he crossed the border into Holland, he very ostentatiously went up to a surprised Dutch border guard and, and handed him his sword. Oh, sorry, and the Dutch guard, I don't know what to do. Uh, the Dutch gave Wilhelm uh, asylum, and uh, that's where he would live until he died in 1941. But with that, he was out. Yeah. Um, I thought uh, Poppin had announced his abdication without his consent. There may be something to that. I don't know. But um, he, anyway, he went through with it. He didn't try to fight it. Um, now, that didn't mean the war was over. And there were some on the Allied side, most especially uh, Pershing, who argued that until the Allied armies went into Germany itself, until the German people saw French, Belgian, British, British Empire, and American soldiers on their streets, they would not accept that they were defeated. The British and the French especially, though, were anxious to see the war end. Now, they were anxious because they didn't want to see any more of their young men killed. They'd, they'd seen enough young men killed. But they were also anxious to see the war end because they knew the longer the war went on, the more the Americans would become a, a if not dominant, a major force in the Allied armies. And that would give Wilson a stronger hand to play in the peace negotiations. And that was the one thing that they did not want. You've probably heard of this book, um, All Quiet on the Western Front. This is the original German uh, cover. That's one of the early English translations. The writer, Eric Maria Remark, uh, was in the German army during the last uh, two years or so of the war. It's probably uh, the most famous war novel of all time. But what Remark tells you in that book um, is that the German army was defeated in this war. The big lie that the Nazis would tell, that the army had been stabbed in the back, that was untrue. And remark in one passage that I'd like to read to you, which I, I will send, uh, makes this plain. He says, there are too many fresh English and American regiments over there. For every one German plane, there are five, at least five English and American. For every one hungry, wretched German soldier, there come the enemy, fresh and fit. And that's where I would argue the American presence on the battlefield was important, because from the Allied perspective, that meant there was this unending source of new manpower to lean on that could finish the war. From the German side, that meant that they were fighting an enemy that had not been bloodied over the last four years, that the war was lost.
the Americans uh, recruited all over the country, uh, including uh, American Indians. These are men from the Choctaw Nation, the uh, sometimes called the original code breakers. Uh, they were in the American military even though <laughs> they were not American citizens at the time. American Indians were not given citizenship until 1924. Uh, you may wonder why the people of Puerto Rico are American citizens. Puerto Ricans were made American citizens in 1917 so they could be drafted. Oh my. Right? These are the famous Harlem Hellfighters. Uh, the American army was segregated during the First World War. Black American soldiers were not allowed to serve in combat units. The commander of this unit, uh, a National Guard unit, wanted his men in combat. So he turned to the French. The French were perfectly happy to have his men fight for them. And that's why these American soldiers are wearing French helmets. And they were a highly decorated unit in the French army. The major American battle of the First World War was one of the last. It took place in this place called the Meuse Argonne between September and November 1918. This battle of the Meuse Argonne uh, is the, make sure I got these, term, these uh, uh, correct here. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, the Meuse Argonne um, is uh, the largest American uh, battle in history. 1.2 million men took part. 1.2 million men took part. At the opening of the battle, just the opening day of the battle, the American artillery fired more artillery shells on that first day, the Battle of the Argonne, than the Union Army fired cannonballs during the entire Civil War. That was just on the first day. According to one reckoning, the Battle of the Argonne is the equivalent of seven Gettysburgs, which is astonishing when you think about it because I would bet that not one American in 10,000 has ever heard of this battle. Twenty-six thousand Americans died by the end. Overall, between the time the Americans entered the war in April 1917 and the war ended in the autumn of 1918, in that short period of time, four million Americans by November 1918 were serving in the military. Two million were already overseas. And as I just said, over one million were in combat. Most of them fighting at the Argonne, like these four men. Yeah? Those numbers were by the end of the war? By the end of the war. The war came to a sudden end at the 11th hour on the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. The 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918. Yes, sir. How did we lose so many men in such a short time? because we didn't learn any of the lessons that the other powers had learned during the war. Uh, the American commanders overall were not any better than the French, the British, any of the others. Yes, sir? 11 a.m. or p.m.? A.m. Okay. I ended a bit early so you guys could have, I, I went through a whole lot. I took you from the Somme to Armistice Day in an hour and 10 minutes. Questions? Are you sure? <laughs>
Yeah. When I missed it, it was like kind of a while ago. <laughs> I just That's kept okay. going. But, um, the leaders of the Allied coalition governments were Lloyd oh. George. You know, I saw you blink when you when I when I switched that. And I was like, Ugh. yes. Uh, Lloyd David Lloyd George was the Prime Minister of Great Britain. George Clemenceau. So you want me to spell it for you? I got that one. It was just the third. One. Oh, Vittorio Orlando. Just think of Orlando, Florida. Um, and he was the Premier of Italy. And again, you know, you're going to get your fill of these guys Wednesday when I talk about the Treaty of Versailles. Nothing? Well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, we can call it a day. I will see you on Wednesday. Thank you all very much. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out Season 2 of the Presidential Recordings podcast. The second season focuses on taped conversations between President Richard Nixon on topics ranging from the Watergate scandal to his nominees for the Supreme Court. The Presidential Recordings Podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts.